Good evening to everyone present here with us today. This is Shreyan from IGCP. I would like to welcome all the viewers who have joined our platform for better exchange of knowledge that is going to be shared by our keynote speaker doctor for today's session. With much pleasure and honor, I would like to welcome a very renowned doctor, Dr. M. Chinappan. Sir is MBBS MD DM Cardiology Consultant Cardiologist at Ramkrishna Nursing Home. Sir is also the Director of Medical Education Apollo Society Hospitals, sorry, Apollo Specialty Hospital, Trichy. With the help of Sir and his wonderful insight, we will be taking a close look on today's topic, which is chest pain. Common but challenging symptoms. Now, without any further delay, I would like to welcome Sir at our forum and would like to hand over the session to him. Over to you, Sir. Uh, thank you. Good evening to all. <clears throat> it's a great pleasure I want to be uh, presenting my lecture on the IJCP forum. So the topic for today is that uh, chest pain, a common but a challenging symptom. Why we are talking about chest pain today? It is because the chest pain itself is not a very uh, descriptive term. It is often used to describe any pain not necessarily the pain. It can be a pressure, squeezing, choking, or numbness, or any other discomfort in the chest. So not necessarily chest pain can be pain itself, can be discomfort. So it's not only the different in quality of the particular pain or discomfort, and need not be in the chest at all. It can be the chest, neck, or the abdomen, and also in the shoulders, and often associated with the pain in the jaw, head and arms. So it can radiate, it can happening in variety of places and it can be of different characters. So the duration itself is uh, going to be varying. It can be a uh, less than a second to days and weeks and it can occur frequently or rarely, can occur sporadically or predictably. You can see so much of uh, variables are there in chest pain itself. That's why it is a common symptom but a challenging symptom. So we must also understand it is one of the leading cause of malpractice suits against emergency care physicians because it is uh, it is because failure to diagnose myocardial infarction almost occurs in 10% of cases uh, which are filed against emergency physicians and most often the 5% of acute myocardial pa pa patients are sent home without diagnosing as uh, myocardial infarction because the chest pain is not uh, gone into details with a good history. And of course, why this is happening is because of the physician inexperience and also the patient is also presenting with all type of atypical presentations. So now this is going to be a bigger and bigger problem because as you know, the time is muscle and acute myocardial infarction. So you lose the time by not diagnosing early and making the patient to come later by the time by which uh, by which time the myocardium is dead and gone so definitely you will be definitely questioned and also sued so what will be our approach today will be to say whether the, how to identify a chest pain as cardiac or non cardiac in cardiac whether it is coronary or non coronary in coronary itself whether it is acute or chronic in acute, whether it is a ST elevation ACS and non-ST elevation ACS. If it is chronic, how to identify a chronic uh, 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 chest pain as high risk or low risk. So there are a lot of uh, cardiac pains which are non-coronary. There are a lot of pains which are non-coronary and non-cardiac chest pains. So this is my approach to tell you the common but a challenging symptom. So the defining chest pain itself will change now. Today, we have to define the chest pain as definitely a cardiac chest pain or a possibly a cardiac chest pain or non-cardiac chest pain. There is no longer a term used called atypical chest pain. So it is likely to be cardiac, possibly cardiac or non-cardiac. So first we look at uh, the most important chest pain of all, which is a coronary chest pain. How to identify a chest pain being a coronary disease, whether it's acute or chronic, how to identify an ischemic chest pain. So for that, we have to go to 1822 for the original definition 
of William Hubbard. So although we have seen so much of advances happening in the field of cardiology, but no definition has improved the definition of William Hubbard in 1822. He starts saying the angina pectoris is a disorder of the breast marked with strong and peculiar symptoms. And the most important thing is this uh, discomfort or pain will be always accompanied by a kind of danger, a kind of danger. And it is not rare, it is very common. So it's, it's actually the angina means a sense of strangling. So you can see that here, it is not pain at all. It is a sense of strangling and the anxiety with which it is attended and happening in the pectoral region. That's why it's called angina pectoris. The next description is very important. Those who are afflicted with it are seized. See the word he is using. Whenever the patient has uh, walking and he has got this discomfort or pain, he will cease. He will not stop. He will cease. That means that he feels the next step will kill him. And this stress pain is going to come while they are walking. More particularly when they are walking soon after eating. With painful, and you can see that is a most disagreeable sensation in the breast, which seems as if it will take their life away if it were to increase or to continue. This is the kind of danger he is describing in the first paragraph. And what is very important is the moment that stands still, all this uneasiness vanishes. So this is a beautiful definition. So if you are able to understand and remember this definition, you will never miss an angina pectoris in your clinical uh, practice because angina is diagnosed in history. Especially an angina on exertion is diagnosed only in history because at the rest, your ECG is going to be normal, your echo is going to be normal, but the history itself will tell you that this patient has got an angina pectoris. So that's what I told you. It is not a pain alone. Many times it is a discomfort. Especially the ischemic pain can be most often a discomfort rather than a pain. It can be heaviness, squeezing, gripping, compression, burning. So many people come with gases and acidity. That's why many people go on to gastroenterologists and miss the precious time, uneasiness. And many people say, I cannot say this is uh, what? It's only an inconvenient feeling. So that's why when the patient says no chest pain, you should not be satisfied at that. You must always ask these type of inconveniences, what William Hubbard and said as inconveniences or the discomforts in the pain. Many times we think the burning chest pain is always uh, uh, gastrointestinal or an acid peptic disease. Many times acute presentation of an acute ischemic syndrome, burning, uh, maybe a burning chest pain. So please remember in ischemic chest pain, it is an imbalance between the demand and supply. Whenever the myocardial demand is not met by proportionate increase in supply, whenever increase in demand is not met by proportionate increase in supply, you have the symptom of ischemia that is most often the ischemic chest pain or a discomfort. So it's basically a disparity between the demand and supply. So naturally, the factors which are going to increase your myocardial oxygen demand or the factors which are going to decrease your myocardial oxygen supply or coronary supply is going to precipitate angina. So what are they? Exercise, because of increase in heart rate and blood pressure, is going to increase the demand. Emotion, because of the excessive sympathetic activity, once again increases the demand. The cold environment produces vasoconstriction. And because of that, you know, vasoconstriction will decrease not only the coronary flow, but also increase the peripheral resistance and make the work to work harder. So cold environment can decrease the supply and increase the demand. And of course, the heart environment is going to produce vasodilatation. Because of that, there is a reflex uh, tachycardia will increase the myocardial oxygen demand. So what happens during food is, especially after a heavy food will be, the, there is a, a, a shift of blood supply to the gastrointestinal system. So naturally, at this point in time, your heart is getting less blood supply. So if you do exertion at that time where the heart is getting less blood supply, the patient may have an angina. REM sleep, the dreams, once again, increasing sympathetic activity, 
which can precipitate arrhythmia. The supine position, so most often supine position, because of increase in preload from the leg veins, the heart has to contract more and pump more. So naturally, the demand is increasing. So naturally, an angina patient, especially a patient with an angina, will be uh, better off in sitting or standing position rather than supine position. That's why it is always said, when you want to give a sublingual nitrate, which is acting by decreasing the venous return, it is better to be given in sitting or uh, especially in patient uh, with during the angina, it should be given with sitting position with hand with a with a legs down or with the with legs hanging down. And bending forward sometimes may produce a decrease in supply by coronary vasoconstriction. Fever with chills once again increase the um, heart rate contractility and also will produce vasodilatation. The most important problem, many patients die in toilets or in commode, it's called commode death, is because of a Valsalva maneuver. So especially a patient, a post-CACS or a post-CABG uh, patient who strains such stool will produce significant Valsalva. By increasing the intrathoracic uh, pressures, there is a sudden decrease in preload resulting in a decreased cardiac output and coronary flow the patient suddenly have a massive uh, infarct and produce and have a sudden death because of primary ventricular fibrillation. So next we come across those. These are the factors which will actually uh, precipitate angina. And we told us the told you the mechanisms also. Then we look at we have seen the character. Then we looked at the precip the uh, uh, the precipitating factors. Then we look at the location of the pain. Most often, the ischemic pain is retrosternal. Although your heart is on the left, most often the pain faint felt on the left lateral area or over the apex is most often non-coronary. Why the ischemic pain is actually retrosternal is to start with heart is embryologically is a central organ. It then uh, rotates and pivots and rotates to le left. That's why it is felt under retrosternal region. So it may radiate to the neck. Most often it may radiate to the neck. It may radiate to the medial aspects of not only the left arm, but also the right arm. So it can also radiate to the jaw. And sometimes it can be the shoulder or it can be sometimes at the back also, sometimes over the upper abdomen also. So these are the locations of the pain. Most often we say any pain above jaw and any pain below the umbilicus is unlikely to be ischemic chest pain. Above jaw and below the umbilicus. So our location of the ischemic pain is this. Most often retrosternal. So to remember the uh, important precipitating factors of angina, I will tell you a story of this man. So this man who is a 40-year-old, 40, 40 or 50-year-old fatty uh, fellow with a hypertension diabetes. So with a, after a full meal inside the restaurant, after a quarrel with his major risk factor wife, comes out and with a cigarette in his mouth, climbs up the hill against the cold wind, a cold wind with a heavy luggage in his hand. So definitely he will have angina because he's got a basic risk factors to have coronary heart disease. He had a mental stress after a full meal. He had a full meal and he had a mental stress with a quarrel and he's smoking and also the cold wind, which is vasoconstricting. And also he's climbing up, which is increasing his exertion with a heavy luggage in his hand. So he's got all the factors which can increase the myocardioxin demand as well as factors which will decrease the myocardial coronary supply. So you can remember the story. You can easily remember the precipitating factors of an angina. So if you want to remember, you can remember E. There are five factors of E. Eating, emotion, exercise, exertion in cold, and carrying excessive weight. So all these things will precipitate an angina. So once you decide this is definitely a coronary pain, the next important aspect or the next step is to decide whether it's acute coronary pain. So acute coronary pain is acute coronary syndrome and how to decide whether it's a chronic coronary pain or acute chest pain. If you have a chronic demand angina, no longer we call them as chronic 
stable angina. The latest term for the chronic coronary disease is chronic coronary syndrome, CCS. In contrast to ACS, we have CCS. So this is what classically we said, the location of the pain, the character of the pain, the radiation of the pain. And most often it is precipitated by the exercise. We told you the precipitating factors. And usually lasts for around 5 to 10 minutes. Any pain which is less than 3 to 4 minutes or less than 5 minutes is unlikely to be angina. At least it should be of 5 minutes to 10 minutes duration. And during the time you can have some physical signs. And the chronic coronary syndrome, you may not have pain at rest at all. The pain at rest at all. Whereas when this type of chronic coronary syndrome pain increases in severity or occurs at rest or occurs even at a yeah, very small exertion. For example, the patient is walking for one kilometer daily and used to get chest pain or this discomfort at one kilometer. Today he is walking one for long and one for long itself the pain is coming. So crescendo angina or angina at rest and lasting for more than uh, 20 minutes but more than 10 minutes, but less than 20 minutes. And it requires more than three to four tablets of sublingual nitrate to relieve the pain he is going for unstable angina or acute coronary, one type of acute coronary syndrome. Whereas the pain at rest itself is very, very severe. And of course, the patient is heaviness and so on. So he's going in for a major acute coronary syndrome and the pain is lasting for more than 30 minutes and not at all relieved by any number of sublingual tablets then of course the patient is going for a severe acute coronary syndrome. So any chest pain which is addressed, the qualities of the pain we have described, the important locations of the pain we have described. So having identified as an ischemic pain and that ischemic pain is going to occur at rest or a new onset and occurring at a small exertion or a chronic coronary syndrome patient having an accelerated or a worsening angina, all these things come under acute coronary syndrome. Having decided acute coronary syndrome, then you have to divide them into non-ST elevation ACS and ST elevation ACS. The non-ST elevation ACS is because of the erosion of the vulnerable block resulting in a platelet thrombus which is rich in platelets and it's a white thrombus. So because it is a platelet rich thrombus, it may not totally occlude a coronary artery, it will critically occlude a coronary artery but allowing some blood flow to the distal myocardium. So this type of patient with a non-ST elevation ACS will come with either ST segment depression or a deep symmetric tall T waves. These patients will present with either a tall T wave or ST segment depression. Whereas in contrast, if the block is going to rupture and both the platelets and the coagulation system is going to be activated, the patient is going to have a huge thrombus, which is not only rich in platelet, but also fibrin. So this is a total occlusion due to red thrombus and this will produce sub-epicardial injury or a pan injury resulting in ST elevation. The most important aspect of treatment is in patients who have got an ST segment depression or non-ST elevation should not be thrombolized. Only those patients who have got an ST elevation should be thrombolized. So now this patient is coming with acute chest pain. So any patient with acute chest pain, ischemic pain, you can now identify. Then you take an immediate electrocardiogram. If more than two leads supplied by the same coronary artery tertiary is going to have ST elevation, more than one millimeter in limb leads and more than one millimeter in other leads except V2, V3, in which it should be more than 1.5 or two millimeters according to the sex and the age of the patient, then you can diagnose an ST elevation ACS. Please remember you have to have only ST elevation of more than one millimeter in two contiguous leads to diagnose STEMI. Here you can identify that many leads are showing ST segment depression than the ST segment elevation. So however leads, however many leads are showing ST segment depression, two leads showing ST segment elevation in two contiguous leads, it is diagnosed as ST elevation acute coronary syndrome and this patient needs a PCI or a thrombolysis. Whereas a patient coming with the same type of chest pain, same type of character, same type of duration, same type of sweating, but he has got now ST segment depression. So it means here we know that this, this acute coronary syndrome is caused by a total occlusion of a thrombus, which is red, which is rich in fibrin. That's why you give a fibrinolytics. Whereas here we know because ST segment depression is a critical occlusion with the white thrombus. So we'll never thrombolyze this patient. 
and according to the risk of the patient, we send them for straight away a coronary angiogram and suitable revascularization. So that's why it is very, very important to not only decide about acute coronary syndrome or diagnose about acute coronary syndrome, the treatment options are very, very important because the same type of chest pain, you are going to give two different type of treatment only based on whether it is ST elevation or ST second depression. That's why the identification of acute coronary syndrome with the ECG and the ECG knowledge, which will tell you whether it's a critical occlusion with white thrombus or a total occlusion with a red thrombus is crucial. So having decided that ST elevation is, yes, you are going to give a thrombolytic therapy here. So then what happens in non-ST elevation ACS? In a non-ST elevation ACS, you have to do a troponin. So if the troponin is negative, that patient is called unstable angina for the same ECG changes. For example, the patient has got ST segment depression and the ECG changes are same. Two patients are having a similar ST segment depression. But one patient is troponin negative, he is called unstable angina. One patient who has got a troponin positive is called non-ST elevation MI. So the differentiation between unstable angina and non-ST elevation MI is not decided by the ECG. It is decided by the positivity or negativity of troponin. Naturally, when the troponin is positive, this becomes not only a myocardial infarction, non-ST elevation, but it also becomes a high risk. But please remember, we will not be doing troponin at the acute phase of ST elevation MI because you should not be waiting for the troponin result to thrombolyze a patient. So what is necessary for a patient to thrombolyze or going PCI is the ECG criteria to diagnose ST elevation ACS. And if you are diagnosing, if you are uh, sure about it is uh, ST elevation ACS. And if you are thrombolyzing, look at the contraindication for thrombolyze. And don't ever wait for troponin, send troponin, wait for troponin to thrombolyze the patient. So the troponin role is primarily in non-ST elevation ACS to decide whether it's unstable angina or non-ST elevation MI. So having decided that if you are in a tertiary center, it is possible to either immediately do a PCA or a thrombolysis. But if you are in a center, for example, in your rural center or a semi-urban center, or in your clinic where you are just seeing the OP patients, then if you are taking ECG, then the question comes whether you have to send the patient to a PCI or a thrombolysis. The first important point is the affordability of the patient. So the patient cannot afford a PCA, the patient should go for a thrombolysis. But the most important thing is the duration in which your PCA can be done. The primary PCA goes over the thrombolysis only when it is done less than 120 minutes of the first medical contact. So that means this 120 minutes is divided into 30 minutes to reach the hospital and 90 minutes from that hospital door to the uh, uh, PCA time. So door to PCA time is 90 minutes, reaching the hospital is 30 minutes. Only within this 120 minutes of PCA can be done. PCA is better than a thrombolysis. Then you can send straight away the PCI if the patient is uh, affordable. But the patient cannot afford and it takes three hours for the patient to reach the tertiary hospital. But in a nearby ICU, you, where, where the patient go, can go within 10 minutes, the thrombolysis can be done. So straight away, or you can do a thrombolysis in your hospital within 10 minutes, do that. So it all depends upon what is the time taken for the PCA to be done to decide whether it should be given a PCA option or a thrombolytic therapy. So that's why we have system goals. We have a lot of uh, times to achieve. So I told you about the first medical contact to PCA hospital is 30 minutes plus 90 minutes. Door to bolus time. Today, it is not the door to needle time. Previously, you used to talk about Door to needle time less than 30 minutes. That is your, your streptokinase. Now it is a bolus of center place. So a patient enters the door of the hospital with acute chest pain. Within 10 minutes, the bolus of tenecta place should be given. After, within that, you should have health history, taken the chest pain, and decided the patient needs yeah, thrombolysis, and the bolus of tenecta place should be given in 90 minutes. Today, it is not a door to balloon time. It is called door to wire time, which is less than 60 minutes in the tertiary hospital. For example, you are not doing anything of thrombolysis or PCA you are going to refer. The door in and door out time should be less than 30 minutes. For example, you are sitting in OP and the patient is coming with acute chest pain. And within 30 minutes, you should be taking the ECG. You should have diagnosed an acute coronary syndrome. You should have given the loading doses of aspirin, clopidogrel, and statins. You should have arranged the transport. You should have informed the tertiary doctor that the patient is coming. And within 30 minutes, you have to send that acute coronary syndrome patient 
to either a ICU for thrombolysis or a tertiary hospital for a PCI. So the diseases don't read textbooks. So a classical ischemic pain uh, uh, does not go to the textbook and read William Hebbardon's definition and come exactly in the patient where, which, the, uh, which uh, the definition of uh, uh, the William Hubbard. So there are a lot of atypical presentations of ischemic chest pain, especially in diabetics, elderly and women. In these three groups, you have to be very, very careful and they may not be presenting with a classical chest pain. It can present when you start with atypical presentation, B for breathlessness, C for palpitation and cardiac arrhythmia and excessive sweating alone, uh, especially emotional disturbances, fatigability, especially in diabetics. The EC fatigability may be a sign of acute coronary syndrome. Gastric complaint hiccups may be happening in acute inferior infarction. Sometimes a silent myocardial infarction happening during the uh, perioperative period. So you must be aware of this atypical presentations and don't look at classical presentations in some of the patients. So there are a lot of gender differences in the presentation of ischemic pain between men and women. So the typical uh, symptom in both sexes are pain, pressure, squeezing, stabbing, pain in the chest, but the women will present with more of mild symptoms. They can even present without chest pain. The classical radiation may be there in men, but there is sudden on of weakness and shortness of breath may be there in women as an acute condition. I told you about fatigue, the body aches, overall feeling of illness without chest pain. So here, the difficulty in breathing, the heartburn, nausea, all these things may have cold sweats and famines and dizziness, whereas many times the women will present with all type of atypical manifestations, weakness, shortness of breath, fatigability, body aches, and chest and arm and jaw pain, even without chest pain. So when all these type of uh, uh, atypical presentations are happening, don't ever forget or don't ever fail to record an electrocardiogram in women. So most often, the uh, uh, the pain may be there and we diagnose a coronary artery disease, but sometimes the coronary artery disease, even acute coronary syndrome, can happen without chest pain. And it is very, very important to identify silent coronary artery disease even before it presents a classical chest pain and a classical acute coronary syndrome. That's why it's very important to diagnose very early the subclinical atherosclerosis by means of your uh, uh, risk factors, risk markers such as the uh, um, atherosclerotic markers, AB index, or your uh, carotid plugs or carotid brui. So there are many risk markers will tell you subclinical atherosclerosis is also happening. So waiting for chest pain or a positive stress test to diagnose CAD is like waiting for labor pain to diagnose pregnancy. So many times acute coronary syndrome, this acute plugs or acute thrombus may be actually ac the acute atheroma or the plug will be growing inside a coronary artery without producing any sort of outside uh, presentations. So that's why there are a lot of tests to identify today. Even a good a CT angiogram will tell you the minor plugs, coronary artery calcium, and the patients having a, a carotid plug or the patient having abnormal ankle brachial index. So all this, even patient with the microalbuminuria is a sign of endothelial dysfunction. So there are so many tests to say and diagnose a subclinical atherosclerosis. So try to identify a subclinical atherosis in high-risk individuals and do appropriate intervention so that you will prevent an acute coronary syndrome. So that's why it is important to diagnose the preclinical silent age, do appropriate intervention and prevent and, and the progression of acute coronary syndrome. So having finished the uh, cardiac coronary pain, we look at the cardiac non-coronary pain. The pain is not coronary pain if it is going to be like this. A pain which is pricking in nature, which is related to respiration, which is pricking. Pricking pain is unlikely to be an angina. And chest movements and cough is precipitating. It is unlikely to be angina. And primary or sole location of the discomfort is the lower abdomen. Below the umbilicus, it is unlikely to be angina. And if the patient is able to show you this is the area with the tip of the finger. I have chest pain. And especially over the left lateral area, over the left lateral apex, with the tip of the finger, in only this area, the pain is there. Then it is unlikely to be angina. If the patient is ripped, when you touch and press that area of the pain, 
and the patient feels pain. That means the tenderness is there on the area of the pain. It is unlikely to be angina. And very long duration of pain or a very brief pain, a pain comes as lightning. A lightning is unlikely to be an angina. Or pain is lasting for 24 hours without break at all. It cannot be angina. And of course, as I told you, any pain which is radiating below the umbilicus and going into the lower extremities is unlikely to be angina. So that's what the classical chest pain is likely to be central, pressure, squeezing, gripping, heaviness, tightness. And next, I told you about the five E's and retrosternal. This is a typical of ischemic pain. What is a not typical of an ischemic pain? Sharp, pricking, fleeting, shifting, and also retro posture, respiration, positional. All these pains are unlikely to be an ischemic pain or an anginal pain. Right. The most important pain is a pericarditis pain, which will exactly mimic an acute uh, myocardial infarction, especially when the ECG is also showing you ST elevation. So the patient has got chest pain, the patient got ST elevation, you have all, the, uh, you have all the temptation to diagnose it is an ST elevation MI. What are the differences? So as I told you, it can last for many days and hours and, uh, and it is a pricking chest pain. And it can be usually on the lateral chest and also it is related to respiration, especially when it is patient is uh, uh, actually moving. The patient may be either getting relieved or getting precipitated. So it may be relieved by sitting up or leaning forward. And of course, when you auscultate, the patient may have a pericarditis pain. So what are the differences? The acute pericarditis pain is sudden onset, whereas it's going to be ischemic pain is gradual. At left precardial, it's a substernal. And the radiation of the pain is not very typical. Here, radiation is typical. As I told you, pricking, it is not, I told you, time. it is a squeezing, pressure, and so on. In related to respiration, not related to respiration. And as I told you, it may last for many, many hours. It, is, it is, comes in paroxysms. And body movements increases the pain. Body movement does not increase, actually. Sitting may relieve the pain in angina. And the posture works on recumbency. That's why I told you, improved on sitting or leaning forward. And this is not going to happen in angina. Nitroglycine will not receive uh, relieve pericarditis. And usually, the ischemic pain will be relieved within five minutes. Then the important cardiac, but not coronary pain, which will mimic a coronary pain. Even the ECG may show... Yeah, ST elevation because of the coronary dissection, coronary uh, dissection is acute aortic dissection. And do you know about the DBAC is uh, uh, classification? So what is very important to suspect aortic dissection in all acute chest pains? Then only we can diagnose because this pain will come with chest pain. And also the ECG shows ST elevation. You immediately tend to thrombolyze this patient. But there are important differentiation points between an acute dissection and acute ischemic pain. So here, the ischemic pain we have seen here, it is a, it's usually builds up over minutes and hours. It starts slowly, it starts uh, 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 slowly, and then it uh, goes into crescendo. Whereas a yeah, dissection pain is dramatic onset. So the first second itself, the patient will have the maximum onset of pain. So you can remember the pain of subarachnoid hemorrhage or a headache of the subarachnoid hemorrhage as thunderclap headache. So we can say this is a thunderclap chest pain. It's a dramatic chest pain at the beginning itself. And the character of the pain is worse off and tearing. And usually it is uh, mainly situated at the back of the patient, the lower back of the patient. And also it will mimic acute MI and it's most often over the back. So back pain is more than retrosternal pain in a uh, dissection. So the most important thing is it can radiate below the umbilicus. So you can see that here it can radiate lower limbs. And because the lower arteries are involved here, so it will be can lower in bed. So uh, if the patient has got a, a coronary artery dissection, ST elevation is possible. There are two important clinical signs. One is asymmetry of pulses. And when you auscultate, there is a murmur of acute aortic regurgitation. And of course, the patient is predisposing factors of systemic dissection dilated diota and Marfan syndrome. So this is a good practice to go into all this, especially whether it's a dramatic onset, whether it's predominantly over the back, whether it is going down the umbilicus, and what is the character of the pain, 
and also whether you have the asymmetry of pulses or acute dissection will definitely differentiate the acute chest pain. So whenever you think of these features, features are there and you are suspecting dissection, don't thrombolyze the patient because thrombolysis is contraindicated in this patient. So if you have any doubt of dissection, acute dissection, it is better to do immediate echocardiography or transitive or do a CT, rule out a dissection before you thrombolyze the patient. So that is a very important uh, history itself will tell you whether it is a dissection. Another cardiac but non-coronary pain we commonly come across is mitral valve prolapse. Usually these people are young, thin, uh, tall ladies or uh, tall women who come with the mitral valve prolapse, some sort of Marfan syndrome patients. And the chest pain is not at all typical and we cannot describe any uh, pain at all for these patients, young, tall, lean females. So the important clue is a non-ejection click. And you can even show some sort of minor ST, uh, STT changes or non-specific STT changes. And excitus itself is knowledge positive. Echocardiogram is diagnostic. And of course, it has got a favorable prognosis. And that's why this is completely going to be atypical, but by which I mean the character is not likely to be angina, or the precipitating factors are not going to be angina, or the relieving factors are not going to be like angina. So in MVP, if the patient has got only significant prolapse, wall thickness is increased, or significant mitral regurgitation is present, with a chamber dilatation arrhythmias, then only the patient needs any intervention. When none of these things are there, it is only a mitral wall prolapse diagnosed by echo alone, patient does not need any treatment. In some situations, to do nothing at all is the most difficult thing in the world, but the most difficult and the most intellectual. So this author world's uh, uh, definite, this uh, quote is definitely fits in for a mitral prolapse. A simple a mitral prolapse echo report and you say that the patient has got a valvular problem, then the patient develops all sorts of cardiac symptoms and becomes a cardiac neurotic. In pulmonary embolism, the pain is primarily because of the pulmonary infarct and because of that, the pleuritic chest pain, which will mimic a chest pain of an ischemic nature. But we already know what is a pleuritic pain. It is a lateral side, pricking in nature, and it is related to deep inspiration, change in posture, and all, and also in your auscultate, there will be a pleural rub. So in this way, so most often, a very important presentation of embolism is likely to be acute dyspnea rather than acute chest pain. Chest pain may come a little later than the dyspnea, and chest pain may not be the presenting symptom of a patient with acute pulmonary embolism. And what is the dangers? There are four important chest pain which are very dangerous. We already told you about acute coronary syndrome, and you know how it presents. The pulmonary embolism is dyspnea and pleuritic chest pain. An aortic dissection, we told you about the character. Tearing, you look at the application, it's a back and radiating down the umbilicus, asymmetry of pulses, acute re re regurgitation. So that is acute dissection. And another important non cardiac pain, which is very dangerous, is esophageal rupture. So the patient have an excessive vomiting, they can have a subcutaneous emphysema. Most of the patients, especially one in five, will have a pneumothorax and they will have decreased breath sounds on one aspect of the lung. So these are the four dangerous chest pains. It can be ischemic or non-ischemic cardiac or non-cardiac. So please remember the characters of this pain. Then we come to the non-cardiac chest pains, non-coronary, non-cardiac chest pains. As I told you, some of the non-cardiac chest pains also can be very dangerous, like your esophageal rupture. So they are not always benign. So these are the uh, differential diagnosis. It can be a respiratory chest pain because of pulmonary embolism, pneumothorax, pneumomedia sternum, pneumonia, pleural irritation, and malignancy. It can be gastrointestinal in the form of cholecystitis. These are all very, very dangerous gastrointestinal pain. Cholecystitis, acute cholecystitis, pancreatitis, although they are non-cardiac, they are dangerous. Whereas here in the pneumothorax and pulmonary embolism, all the non-cardiac dangerous. So similarly, non-cardiac chest pain, you must also know which are the dangerous chest pain, peptic ulcer, esophageal spasm, dyspepsia. And of course, chest ball pain is most often benign in the form of costochondritis, trauma. The herpes zoster most often will miss and surgical radiculopathy, breast disease, rib fracture, and musculoskeletal pain. And of course, when you exclude all this, the patient continue to have pain 
uh, with no identifiable organic heart disease or non-cardiac disease, it is likely to be psychological. So the three important non-cardiac chest pains are likely to come from the respiratory and the abdomen and also from the musculoskeletal system. So these are the three important non-cardiac uh, regions or non-cardiac organs which can produce non-cardiac chest pain, a respiratory chest pain, a gastrointestinal chest pain, or musculoskeletal chest pain. So how to identify a gastric or esophageal pain? So many times, even for uh, many times, even after a very long experience, sometimes it is very difficult to say whether this particular retrosternal pain is an esophageal pain or a typical angina, because it can mimic, the esophageal pains can exactly mimic the anginal pain, especially when it is retrosternal. But there are certain important differentiating factors. That is, it is precipitated by the provocation of swallowing. Many times the patient may have oral regurgitation of liquid or the excessive salivation. And the important factor of history is that this esophageal pain will not have radiation. So many times I told you the radiation can be to the up to the jaw or it can be to the lateral radiation. So there is no radiation to the arms for the esophageal pain relieved by antacids. And many times in hiatus hernia, the patient's pain will be precipitated by bending. The, you, the patient used to say, I have difficulty in uh, bending down and taking some objects from the floor and so on. That can be a typical hiatus hernia and no typical relationship to exercise and frequent episodes of spontaneous rest pain and sometimes nocturnal pain and prolonged remission. After a course of uh, the uh, PPIs, the patient may have, uh, for example, one or two hour tears, he may not have pain at all. But another important confusing point is esophageal spasm, which will exactly mimic an angina, will also will have a response to nitroglycerin. So it can be also relieved by nitroglycerin. So, but the important thing is the differentiating point between the response of nitroglycerin to angina is within five to 10 minutes. But esophageal spasm takes more than 15 to 20 minutes for it to get relieved. <coughs> so that is an important differentiating point between the angina and esophageal spasm. The next important pain is the musculoskeletal pain, especially the skeletal pain which is called TEAT syndrome or idiopathic osteochondritis. Very easy to diagnose because the, here, the patient is able to show you, this is the area I have pain. And he's also able to show you that single finger is able to show you where is the pain. And also when you press that area, that costochondral junction, the patient is going to have pain. So the tenderness is there, localization is there, one single area, and not related to exertion, emotion, eating, and so on. So there may be swelling also. Then sometimes the patient may have the swelling also. The second drip or the second costochondral junction is most often involved in this uh, particular uh, uh, costochondritis or the teeth syndrome. And don't ever uh, and, uh, send the patient without stripping and seeing the site of pain. Because if you just auscultate or examine the patient without taking the cloth of the patient, the patient having a severe pain, the important pain which actually mimics an acute coronary syndrome is herpes zoster. So especially the uh, roots which are involved in the chest wall and uh, the choose, uh, supplying the chest wall is involved. Definitely this patient have an extensive severe pain. Most often this is mistaken for an acute coronary syndrome and so on. So always trip and see any patient with acute chest pain to rule out the herpes zoster. That is another non-cardiac chest pain which will mimic an acute coronary syndrome. So when you rule out all the other things I told you, respiratory, the esophagus, and also the skeletal pains, then it becomes psychogenic. Psychosomatic, just like I told you, mitral prolapse, all sorts of chest pain. There may be brief, there may be prolonged, they may not be related to exertion, and they will be actually uh, sort of depressed are very anxious, the tenderness may be there, so you can easily identify they are stressed. The very important uh, physical finding is the deep sighing. These patients will always have a deep sighing whenever, uh, when you are auscultating them or when you are seeing them 
or they are eliciting ST. And of course, the pain, panic attack comes with all sorts of palpitations and chest pain and so on. So please remember the psychogenic pain is always a pain of exclusion. When you exclude all the other causes of chest pain and still the chest pain is present, then only you have to come to a diagnosis of non-organic or psychological chest pain. So this is my approach to the chest pain. So especially in acute chest pain, ongoing chest pain. So if the patient is in shock, definitely immediately send the patient to ICU and necessary uh, treatment should be immediately started. When the patient is stable, what is important is to have a focused history. You cannot be taking a detailed history. Focus history and physical examination and should be completed within five minutes of presentation. What is that? The character of the pain, the location of the pain, the radiation of the pain, what is precipitating, all this within five minutes. So you have a potential acute cardiac chest pain and take an immediate ultrocardiogram. So that will tell you whether there's acute coronary syndrome and acute coronary syndrome, then you can see whether it's ST elevation or ST syndrome depression. ST elevation goes for thrombolysis or primary PCI, whereas the ST depression patient, according to the risk, goes for straightaway coronary angiography without having a thrombolysis. Then, of course, if you think the pain is tearing maximum at onset, uh, predominantly over the back, and the pain is radiating down to the legs, and asymptomatic pulses and acute, real, acute aortic regurgitation, then, of course, you can do a transesophageal echo or a CT to diagnose a dissection. So don't ever thrombolyze a patient when you have a yeah, suspicion of dissection. And the patient is predominantly coming to dyspnea, but the patient is having a lateral chest pain, which is related to respiration, and the pain is uh, typically pricking. And of course, you know, it is likely to be a pulmonary embolism, pulmonary infarct, and you can uh, go to the pathway of that. Then, of course, you know that the gastrointestinal or musculoskeletal, we told you the characters of uh, the gastrointestinal pain provoked by swallowing, uh, food precipitates it or food relieves it, and the bending down will precipitate the pain, and there is no radiation. It can be still burning, relieved by antacids, prolonged remissions. So all these things we told you how to recognize uh, GA pain. And of course, a localized pain, and the patient is able to show the site of the pain with a single finger, and there is tenderness, and there is a swelling of that uh, costochondral junction. It is likely to be a musculoskeletal pain. So this is how we can approach the chest pain. And of course, when you look at the uh, important areas of the pain, any pain above the jaw, any pain in the right lateral region, any pain left lateral region, any pain above the jaw, any pain below the umbilicus is unlikely to be a ischemic of origin. So these are the pains which are unlikely to be ischemic of origin, whereas in all the other areas, the ischemic possibility is there, the non-ischemic cardiac pain is there, you have a gastrointestinal pain is there, you have a musculoskeletal pain is there, also you have a respiratory pain is there. So this is how you can uh, approach a chest pain. So this is actually the uh, summary slide. So in chest pain means always the pain, not necessarily the pain, it can be a chest discomfort. So in acute chest pain, if it is a non-ST elevation ACS, do your troponin. Today it is high sensory troponin to decide whether it's a non-ST elevation MI or acute instable angina. What is very important is time is muscle. In acute coronary syndrome, your time in, time out is, should be less than 30 minutes. Your um, door to needle, door to bolus time is less than 10 minutes. Door to uh, wire time is less than 60 minutes. And of course, you can, when you are in doubt, you can always share the decision making with the patient, with it, whether to thrombolyze, whether to your PCI, especially in acute coronary syndrome. And of course, treating routinely is not an, in low risk patients and taking all sorts of investigation is not necessary also. So testing, you have to be individualized. Then of course, the P, is, the P stands for pathways. So whenever it's acute coronary syndrome, what is the pathway? Dissection, what is the pathway? pulmonary embolism, what is the pathway, and so on. And of course, what are the accompanying symptoms likely to be present with academic symptom, which is un you have to always identify whether acute coronary syndrome patient coming with a shock, dyspnea, acute pulmonary edema, or a ventricle tachycardia. So all these things you have to take care of the accompanying symptom also. Then identify the patient who are likely to benefit from the further testing. This is what I told you. So which patient needs a coronary angiogram, which patient does not need a coronary angiogram, you have to identify. Then of course, identify the non-cardiac chest pain, and we have told you how to identify that. 
Then, of course, you have structured risk markers for all this pulmonary embolism. Uh, acute coronary syndrome, you have a structured risk course, how to uh, identify a high risk patient from the risk course and so on. So use the scoring system and thereby will not only identify a particular problem, you can also expect the prognosis and according to that, you can plan a particular management. Thank you for your patient listening. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for your wonderful presentation. We have some questions from our audience, if you'd like to take that up. Sure. So, sir, the first question is, what consideration are essential in the post-acute phase management of patients who have experienced chest pain? The, it all depends upon what chest pain the patient had. If the patient has got acute coronary syndrome, if the patient has acute coronary syndrome, you will have the pathway. If the patient has got a TCI or a thrombolysis, the patient should be followed with the dual antiplatelets and uh, 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 antithrombin therapies like aparin, cytostatins, the beta blockers, AC inhibitors. So all this done also the treatment of complications like LV dysfunction or arrhythmias and so on. And of course, so that is the pathway. So it is all depends. So if a patient has got acute dissection, so you have to decide whether the patient needs a surgery, if it's a type A dissection or a, what is the, whether the surgery is possible in the patient or the conservative management. So in dissection, what is very important is immediately reducing the heart rate and blood pressure. Your blood pressure has to come less than 120 within an hour. And also within, uh, you have to bring down the heart rate and then maintain the blood pressure and heart rate if you are conservative treating the patient. And of course, in pulmonary embolism, you know, immediately, you know, high risk uh, stratify the patient and you have to thrombolyze or not. After thrombolysis, you have to maintain the anticoagulants and so on. So each one of your uh, chest pains have got their own pathway depending upon what type of chest pain you have dealt, acute chest pain you are uh, dealing with, and what is the next subsequent pathway and so on. It all depends upon what acute chest pain. Each one of them have got the subsequent follow-up and treatment. Thank you, sir. So, sir, the next question is, can you share any challenging case related to chest pain that mm -hmm. you have encountered in your practice? So daily we encounter the chest pain. The chest pain is more challenging when uh, uh, it comes in a high risk patient. So in high risk patient, uh, when they come with non cardiac chest pain, this is a most challenging uh, scenario. A high risk patient or a non coronary patient coming with the atypical chest pain. So most often we always think a coronary patient coming with a chest pain. We already think of coronary, but many times they will come with other chest pains which are also dangerous. For example, a coronary patient can come with a dissection. A coronary patient can come with a severe cholecystitis. A coronary patient come with acute pancreatitis. A coronary patient can come with pulmonary embolism. So that's the most challenging part. The challenging part is in a non coronary patient having a pain which is not coronary. So that's why it is very important to have a history. What type of chest pain so far they had? What is the chest pain today? They will be able to definitely tell you the character of chest pain today is different. The presentation is different. So that is the important thing. We cannot automatically assume all coronary patients are going to have coronary pain. Most challenging situation is that. Similarly, a non-coronary pain, for example, a known patient who has got a, a gastrointestinal system, like uh, already had a pancreatitis or already had a cholecystitis, and they come with chest pain, you should not miss a cardiac pain. So many times what happens is our mindset is when the patient has got a single system disease, when the patient presents with a particular symptom, we always think that the particular symptom is uh, uh, confined to the previous disease organ itself. So please get away from that. So each patient see as a new patient of chest pain and try to ask this very important question, whether this particular chest pain or the particular symptom you had is the same symptom you had so many years or so many months or today it is looking different. So that is the most important history which will actually direct you in the right path. Thank you yes. so much, sir. Uh, so the last question is, what are some common non-cardiac causes of chest pain that clinics should be aware of? I told you many things. So when you think it is a non-cardiac chest pain, differentiate them. The differential diagnosis is respiratory, gastrointestinal, musculoskeletal or psychogenic. So these are the four important non-cardiac chest pains. Please remember, as I told you, all non-cardiac chest pains are not always benign. For example, on the respiratory side, if you have a pneumothorax, pulmonary embolism, 
you have a massive pneumonia, they are dangerous. On the gastrointestinal, you have a esophageal spasm, severe spasm or a rupture, or a patient has got acute cholecystitis, pancreatitis, they are dangerous. When you come to the chest wall, chest trauma, pulmonary rib fractures, chest trauma, it is going to be uh, uh, actually dangerous. So these are the four important groups of non-cardiac chest pains. And please remember, in this non-cardiac groups also, don't think all non-cardiac chest pains are benign. You must always understand some of the non-cardiac chest pains are also life-threatening. So even you have diagnosed a non-cardiac chest pain, please rule out life-threatening cause of that non-cardiac chest pain. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for, for answering all our questions. Uh, before concluding today's session, sir, any last remark from you? Yeah, it is always a pleasure. And uh, we know that uh, the ICGP, we have been uh, associated with uh, for many, many decades, I must say. So uh, we, we used to read this uh, publications and also used to read whenever we go to CSI, the each day newsletter we used to read from ICGP. And a great service uh, as well as academic for very many, many years uh, you, are, you are doing. And I wish you all the best. And you will continue to do that uh, for many, many years. I may say many decades, I may say. So I wish you all the best and continue this good service for uh, many more years. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for joining us with your permission.